one of the very earliest incidents of my life which I can recollect. Some people will think it so trifling that it should not be recorded here. You will see, however, by and by, why I mention it. The nursery, as it was called, though I had it all to myself, was a large room in the upper story of the castle with a steep oak roof. I can't have been more than six years old, when one night I awoke, and looking round the room from my bed, failed to see the nursery maid. Neither was my nurse there, and I thought myself alone. I was not frightened, for I was one of those happy children who are studiously kept in ignorance of ghost stories, of fairy tales, and of all such lore as makes us cover up our heads when the door cracks suddenly, or the flicker of an expiring candle makes the shadow of a bedpost dance upon the wall near to our faces. I was vexed and insulted at finding myself, as I conceived, neglected, and I began to whimper, preparatory to a hearty bout of roaring, when, to my surprise, I saw a solemn but very pretty face looking at me from the side of the bed. It was that of a young lady, who was kneeling with her hands under the coverlet. I looked at her with a kind of pleased wonder, and ceased whimpering. She caressed me with her hands, and lay down beside me on the bed, and drew me towards her, smiling. I felt immediately delightfully soothed and fell asleep again. I was wakened by a sensation as if two needles ran into my breast very deep at the same moment, and I cried loudly. The lady started back, with her eyes fixed on me, and then slipped down upon the floor, and, as I thought, hid herself under the bed. I was now, for the first time, frightened, and I yelled with all my might and main. Nurse, nursery maid, housekeeper, all came running in, and hearing my story, they made light of it, soothing me all they could meanwhile. But, child as I was, I could perceive that their faces were pale with an unwanted look of anxiety, and I saw them look under the bed and about the room, and peep under tables and pluck open cupboards, and the housekeeper whispered to the nurse, Lay your hand along that hollow in the bed. Someone did lie there, so sure as you did not. The place is still warm. I remember the nursery maid petting me, and all three examining my chest, where I told them I felt the puncture, and pronouncing that there was no sign visible that any such thing had happened to me. The housekeeper and the two other servants who were in charge of the nursery remained sitting up all night, and from that time a servant always sat up in the nursery until I was about fourteen. I was very nervous for a long time after this. A doctor was called in. He was pallid and elderly. How well I remember his long, saturnine face, slightly pitted with smallpox, and his chestnut wig. For a good while, every second day, he came and gave me medicine, which of course I hated. The morning after I saw this apparition, I was in a state of terror, and could not bear to be left alone, daylight though it was, for a moment. I remember my father coming up and standing at the bedside, and talking cheerfully, and asking the nurse a number of questions, and laughing very heartily at one of the answers, and patting me on the shoulder, and kissing me, and telling me not to be frightened, that it was nothing but a dream, and could not hurt me. But I was not comforted, for I knew the visit of the strange woman was not a dream, and I was awfully frightened. I was a little consoled by the nursery maids assuring me that it was she who had come and looked at me, and lain down beside me in the bed, and that I must have been half dreaming not to have known her face. But this, though supported by the nurse, did not quite satisfy me. I remembered in the course of that day a venerable old man in a black cassock coming into the room with the nurse and housekeeper, and talking a little to them, and very kindly to me. His face was very sweet and gentle, and he told me they were going to pray, and joined my hands together, and desired me to say softly while they were praying, 
Lord, hear all good prayers for us, for Jesus' sake. I think those were the very words, for I often repeated them to myself, and my nurse used for years to make me say them in my prayers. I remembered so well the thoughtful, sweet face of that white-haired old man in his black cassock, as he stood in that rude, lofty, brown room with the clumsy furniture of a fashion three hundred years old about him, and the scanty light entering its shadowy atmosphere through the small lattice. He kneeled, and the three women with him, and he prayed aloud with an earnest, quavering voice for what appeared to me a long time. I forget all my life preceding that event, and for some time after it is all obscure also. But the scenes I have just described stand out, vivid as the isolated pictures of the phantasmagoria surrounded by darkness. End of chapter one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Chapter Two A Guest. I am now going to tell you something so strange that it will require all your faith in my veracity to believe my story. It is not only true, nevertheless, but truth of which I have been an eye witness. It was a sweet summer evening, and my father asked me, as he sometimes did, to take a little ramble with him along that beautiful forest vista which I have mentioned as lying in front of the Schloss. "'General Spielsdorf cannot come to us so soon as I had hoped,' said my father, as we pursued our walk. "'He was to have paid us a visit of some weeks, and we had expected his arrival next day. "'He was to have brought with him a young lady, his niece and ward, Mademoiselle Reinfeld, whom I had never seen, "'but whom I had heard described as a very charming girl, and in whose society I had promised myself many happy days.' I was more disappointed than a young lady living in a town or a bustling neighborhood can possibly imagine. This visit, and the new acquaintance it promised, had furnished my daydream for many weeks. "'And how soon does he come?' I asked. "'Not till autumn. Not for two months, I dare say,' he answered. "'And I am very glad now, dear, that you never knew Mademoiselle Reinfeld. "'And why?' I asked.' both mortified and curious. "'Because the poor young lady is dead,' he replied. "'I quite forgot I had not told you, "'but you were not in the room "'when I received the general's letter this evening.' "'I was very much shocked. "'General Spielsdorf had mentioned in his first letter, six or seven weeks before, "'that she was not so well as he would wish her, "'but there was nothing to suggest "'the remotest suspicion of danger.' "'Here is the general's letter,' he said, handing it to me. "'I am afraid he is in great affliction. "'The letter appears to me to have been written very nearly in distraction.' "'We sat down on a rude bench, under a group of magnificent lime trees. "'The sun was setting with all its melancholy splendor behind the sylvan horizon, "'and the stream that flows beside our home and passes under the steep old bridge I have mentioned.' wound through many a group of noble trees, almost at our feet, reflecting in its current the fading crimson of the sky. General Spielsdorf's letter was so extraordinary, so vehement, and in some places so self-contradictory, that I read it twice over, the second time aloud to my father, and was still unable to account for it, except by supposing that grief had unsettled his mind. 
It said, I have lost my darling daughter, for as such I loved her. During the last days of dear Bertha's illness I was not able to write to you. Before then I had no idea of her danger. I have lost her, and now learn all too late. She died in the peace of innocence, and in the glorious hope of a blessed futurity. The fiend who betrayed our infatuated hospitality has done it all. I thought I was receiving into my house innocence, gaiety, a charming companion for my lost Bertha. Heavens, what a fool have I been! I thank God my child died without a suspicion of the cause of her sufferings. She is gone without so much as conjecturing the nature of her illness and the accursed passion of the agent of all this misery. I devote my remaining days to tracking and extinguishing a monster. I am told I may hope to accomplish my righteous and merciful purpose. At present there is scarcely a gleam of light to guide me. I curse my conceited incredulity, my despicable affectation of superiority, my blindness, my obstinacy, all too late. I cannot write or talk collectedly now. I am distracted. So soon as I shall have a little recovered, I mean to devote myself for a time to enquiry, which may possibly lead me as far as Vienna. Some time in the autumn, two months hence, or earlier, if I live, I will see you. That is, if you permit me. I will then tell you all that I scarce dare put upon paper now. Farewell. Pray for me, dear friend. In these terms ended this strange letter. Though I had never seen Bertha Reinfeld, my eyes filled with tears at the sudden intelligence. I was startled, as well as profoundly disappointed. The sun had now set, and it was twilight by the time I had returned the general's letter to my father. It was a soft, clear evening, and we loitered, speculating upon the possible meanings of the violent and incoherent sentences which I had just been reading. We had nearly a mile to walk before reaching the road that passes the Schloss in front and by that time the moon was shining brilliantly. At the drawbridge we met Madame Perrodon and Mademoiselle de La Fontaine, who had come out without their bonnets to enjoy the exquisite moonlight. We heard their voices gabbling in animated dialogue as we approached. We joined them at the drawbridge, and turned about to admire with them the beautiful scene. The glade through which we had just walked lay before us. At our left... The narrow road wound away under clumps of lordly trees, and was lost to sight amid the thickening forest. At the right the same road crosses the steep and picturesque bridge, near which stands a ruined tower which once guarded that pass, and beyond the bridge an abrupt eminence rises covered with trees, and showing in the shadows some grey ivy-clustered rocks. Over the sward and low grounds a thin film of mist was stealing like smoke, marking the distances with a transparent veil, and here and there we could see the river faintly flashing in the moonlight. No softer, sweeter scene could be imagined. The news I had just heard made it melancholy, but nothing could disturb its character of profound serenity and the enchanted glory and vagueness of the prospect. My father, who enjoyed the picturesque, and I stood looking in silence over the expanse beneath us. The two good governesses, standing a little way behind us, discoursed upon the scene, and were eloquent upon the moon. Madame Perrodon was fat, middle-aged, and romantic, and talked and sighed poetically. Mademoiselle de La Fontaine, in right of her father, who was a German, assumed to be psychological, metaphysical, and something of a mystic, now declared that when the moon shone with a light so intense it was well known that it indicated a special spiritual activity. The effect of the full moon in such a state of brilliancy was manifold. It acted on dreams. 
It acted on lunacy. It acted on nervous people. It had marvelous physical influences connected with life. Mademoiselle related that her cousin, who was mate of a merchant ship, having taken a nap on deck on such a night, lying on his back, with his face full in the light of the moon, had wakened, after a dream of an old woman clawing him by the cheek, with his features horribly drawn to one side, and his countenance had never quite recovered his equilibrium. The moon this night, she said, is full of idyllic and magnetic influence. And see, when you look behind you at the front of the schloss, how all its windows flash and twinkle with that silvery splendor, as if unseen hands had lighted up the rooms to receive fairy guests. There are indolent styles of the spirits, in which, indisposed to talk ourselves, the talk of others is pleasant to our listless ears. And I gazed on, pleased with the tinkle of the ladies' conversation. I have got into one of my moping moods tonight, said my father, after a silence, and quoting Shakespeare, whom, by way of keeping up our English, he used to read aloud, he said, In truth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you, but how I got it, came by it, I forget the rest. But I feel as if some great misfortune were hanging over us, I suppose the poor general's afflicted letter has had something to do with it. At this moment, the unwanted sound of carriage wheels and many hoofs upon the road arrested our attention. They seemed to be approaching from the high ground overlooking the bridge, and very soon the equipage emerged from that point. Two horsemen first crossed the bridge, then came a carriage drawn by four horses, and two men rode behind. It seemed to be the traveling carriage of a person of rank, and we were all immediately absorbed in watching that very unusual spectacle. It became, in a few oh moments, greatly more interesting, for just as the carriage had passed the summit of the steep bridge, one of the leaders, taking fright, communicated his panic to the rest, and after a plunge or two, the whole team broke into a wild gallop together, and dashing between the horsemen who rode in front, came thundering along the road towards us with the speed of a hurricane. The excitement of the scene was made more painful by the clear, long-drawn screams of a female voice from the carriage window. We all advanced in curiosity and horror, me rather in silence, the rest with various ejaculations of terror. Our suspense did not last long. Just before you reach the castle drawbridge, on the route they were coming, there stands by the roadside a magnificent lime tree. On the other stands an ancient stone cross, at sight of which the horses, now going at a pace that was perfectly frightful, swerved so as to bring the wheel over the projecting roots of the tree. I knew what was coming. I covered my eyes, unable to see it out, and turned my head away. At the same moment I heard a cry from my lady friends who had gone on a little. Curiosity opened my eyes, and I saw a scene of utter confusion. Two of the horses were on the ground. The carriage lay upon its side with two wheels in the air. The men were busy removing the traces, and a lady with a commanding air and figure had gotten out, and stood with clasped hands, raising the handkerchief that was in them every now and then to her eyes. Through the carriage door was now lifted a young lady, who appeared to be lifeless. My dear old father was already beside the elder lady, with his hat in his hand, evidently tendering his aid and the resources of his schloss. The lady did not appear to hear him, or to have eyes for anything but the slender girl who was being placed against the slope of the bank. I approached. The young lady was apparently stunned, but she was certainly not dead. My father, who piqued himself on being something of a physician, had just had his fingers on her wrist, and assured the lady, who declared herself her mother, that her pulse, though faint and irregular, was undoubtedly still distinguishable. The lady clasped her hands and looked upward, as if in a momentary transport of gratitude. 
but immediately she broke out again in that theatrical way which is, I believe, natural to some people. She was what is called a fine-looking woman for her time of life, and must have been handsome. She was tall, but not thin, and dressed in black velvet, and looked rather pale, but with a proud and commanding countenance, though now agitated strangely. "'Who was ever being so born to calamity?' I heard her say with clasped hands as I came up. "'Here am I, on a journey of life and death, in prosecuting which to lose an hour is possibly to lose all. My child will not have recovered sufficiently to resume her route for who can say how long. I must leave her. I cannot, dare not, delay. How far on, sir, can you tell us the nearest village?' I must leave her there, and shall not see my darling, or even hear of her till my return three months hence. I plucked my father by the coat, and whispered earnestly in his ear, Oh, Papa, pray ask her to let her stay with us. It would be so delightful. Do pray. If Madame will entrust her child to the care of my daughter, and of her good gouvernante, Madame Perrodon, and permit her to remain as our guest under my charge until her return. It will confer a distinction and an obligation upon us, and we shall treat her with all the care and devotion which so sacred a trust deserves. I cannot do that, sir. It would be to task your kindness and chivalry too cruelly, said the lady distractedly. It would, on the contrary, be to confer on us a very great kindness at the moment when we most need it. My daughter has just been disappointed by a cruel misfortune, in a visit from which she had long anticipated a great deal of happiness. If you confide this young lady to our care, it will be her best consolation. The nearest village on your route is distant, and affords no such inn as you could think of placing your daughter at. You cannot allow her to continue her journey for any considerable distance without danger. If, as you say, you cannot suspend your journey, you must part with her tonight, and nowhere could you do so with more honest assurances of care and tenderness than here. There was something in this lady's air and appearance so distinguished, and even imposing, and in her manner so engaging as to impress one quite apart from the dignity of her equipage, with a conviction that she was a person of consequence. By this time the carriage was replaced in its upright position, and the horses, quite tractable, in the traces again. The lady threw on her daughter a glance which I fancied was not quite so affectionate as one might have anticipated from the beginning of the scene, and then she beckoned slightly to my father, and withdrew two or three steps with him out of hearing and talked to him with a fixed and stern countenance, not at all like that with which she had hitherto spoken. I was filled with wonder that my father did not seem to perceive the change, and also unspeakably curious to learn what it could be that she was speaking almost in his ear with so much earnestness and rapidity. Two or three minutes at most, I think, she remained thus employed. Then she turned, and a few steps brought her to where her daughter lay, supported by Madame Perdon. She kneeled beside her for a moment, and whispered, as Madame supposed, a little benediction in her ear. Then, hastily kissing her, she stepped into her carriage, the door was closed, the footmen in stately liveries jumped up behind, the outriders spurred on, the postillons cracked their whips, the horses plunged and broke suddenly into a furious canter that threatened soon again to become a gallop, and the carriage whirled away, followed at the same rapid pace by the two horsemen in the rear. End of chapter 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. Carmilla by J. Sheridan Lefanu. Read for LibriVox by Elizabeth Clett. Chapter 2.
Chapter 3. We Compare Notes. We followed the cortege with our eyes until it was swiftly lost to sight in the misty wood, and the very sound of the hoofs and the wheels died away in the silent night air. Nothing remained to assure us that the adventure had not been an illusion of a moment but the young lady, who just at that moment opened her eyes. I could not see, for her face was turned from me, but she raised her head, evidently looking about her, and I heard a very sweet voice ask complainingly, Where is Mamma? Our good Madame Perrodon answered tenderly, and added some comfortable assurances. I then heard her ask, Where am I? What is this place? And after that she said, I don't see the carriage. And Matska, where is she? Madame answered all her questions in so far as she understood them, and gradually the young lady remembered how the misadventure came about, and was glad to hear that no one in, or in attendance on, the carriage was hurt, and on learning that her mamma had left her here till her return in about three months, she wept. I was going to add my consolations to those of Madame Perrodon when Mademoiselle de La Fontaine placed her hand upon my arm, saying, Don't approach. One at a time is as much as she can at present converse with. A very little excitement would possibly overpower her now. As soon as she is comfortably in bed, I thought, I will run up to her room and see her. My father, in the meantime, had sent a servant on horseback for the physician, who lived about two leagues away, and a bedroom was being prepared for the young lady's reception. The stranger now rose, and leaning on Madame's arm, walked slowly over the drawbridge and into the castle gate. In the hall, servants waited to receive her, and she was conducted forthwith to her room. The room we usually sat in as our drawing room is long, having four windows, that looked over the moat and the drawbridge, upon the forest scene I have just described. It is furnished in old carved oak, with large carved cabinets, and the chairs are cushioned with crimson Utrecht velvet. The walls are covered with tapestry and surrounded with great gold frames, the figures being as large as life, in ancient and very curious costume, and the subjects represented are hunting, hawking, and generally festive. It is not too stately to be extremely comfortable, and here we had our tea, for with his usual patriotic leanings he insisted that the national beverage should make its appearance regularly with our coffee and chocolate. We sat here this night, and with candles lighted, were talking over the adventure of the evening. Madame Perrodon and Mademoiselle de La Fontaine were both part of our party. The young stranger had hardly lain down in her bed when she sank into a deep sleep, and those ladies had left her in the care of a servant. How do you like our guest? I asked, as soon as Madame entered. Tell me all about her. I like her extremely, answered Madame. She is, I almost think, the prettiest creature I ever saw, about your age, and so gentle and nice. She is absolutely beautiful, threw in Mademoiselle, who had peeped for a moment into the stranger's room. And such a sweet voice, added Madame Perrodon. Did you remark a woman in the carriage after it was set up again who did not get out, inquired Mademoiselle, but only looked from the window? No. We had not seen her. Then she described a hideous black woman with a sort of colored turban on her head and who was gazing all the time from the carriage window, nodding and grinning derisively toward the ladies with gleaming eyes and large white eyeballs and her teeth set as if in fury. Did you remark what an ill-looking pack of men the servants were? asked Madame. Yes, said my father, who had just come in. "'Ugly, hang-dog-looking fellows as ever I beheld in my life. "'I hope they mayn't rob the poor lady in the forest. "'They are clever rogues, however. "'They got everything to rights in a minute. "'I dare say they are worn out with too long travelling,' said Madame. "'Besides looking wicked, their faces were so strangely lean and dark and sullen. "'I am very curious, I own.' "'But I dare say the young lady will tell you all about it tomorrow "'if she is sufficiently recovered.' "'I don't think she will,' said my father, with a mysterious smile, 
and a little nod of his head as if he knew more about it than he cared to tell us. This made us all the more inquisitive as to what had passed between him and the lady in black velvet in the brief but earnest interview that had immediately preceded her departure. We were scarcely alone when I entreated him to tell me. He did not need much pressing. There is no particular reason why I should not tell you. She expressed a reluctance to trouble us with the care of her daughter, saying she was in delicate health and nervous, but not subject to any kind of seizure, she volunteered that, nor to any illusion, being, in fact, perfectly sane. How very odd to say all that, I interpolated. It was so unnecessary. At all events, it was said, he laughed, and as you wish to know all that passed, which was very little indeed, I tell you. She then said, I am making a long journey of vital importance, she emphasized the word, rapid and secret. I shall return for my child in three months. In the meantime, she will be silent as to who we are, whence we come, and whither we are traveling. And that is all she said. She spoke very pure French. When she said the word secret, she paused for a few seconds, looking sternly, her eyes fixed on mine. I fancy she makes a great point of that. You saw how quickly she was gone. I hope I have not done a very foolish thing in taking charge of the young lady. For my part, I was delighted. I was longing to see and talk to her, and only waiting till the doctor should give me leave. You who live in towns can have no idea how great an event the introduction of a new friend is in such a solitude as surrounded us. The doctor did not arrive till nearly one o'clock, but I could no more have gone to my bed and slept than I could have overtaken on foot the carriage in which the princess in black velvet had driven away. When the physician came down to the drawing-room, it was to report very favorably upon his patient. She was now sitting up, her pulse quite regular, apparently perfectly well. She had sustained no injury, and the little shock to her nerves had passed away quite harmlessly. There could be no harm, certainly, in my seeing her if we both wished it, and with this permission I sent forthwith to know whether she would allow me to visit her for a few minutes in her room. The servant returned immediately to say that she desired nothing more. You may be sure I was not long in availing myself of this permission. Our visitor lay in one of the handsomest rooms in the Schloss. It was, perhaps, a little stately. There was a somber piece of tapestry opposite the bed, representing Cleopatra with the asps to her bosom, and other solemn classic scenes were displayed, a little faded, upon the other walls but there was gold carving, and rich and varied color enough in the other decorations of the room to more than redeem the gloom of the old tapestry. There were candles at the bedside. She was sitting up, her slender, pretty figure enveloped in the soft silk dressing gown, embroidered with flowers and lined with thick quilted silk, which her mother had thrown over her feet as she lay on the ground. What was it that, as I reached the bedside and had just begun my little greeting, struck me dumb in a moment, and made me recoil a step or two from before her. I will tell you. I saw the very face which had visited me in my childhood at night, and which remained so fixed in my memory, and on which I had for so many years so often ruminated with horror, when no one suspected of what I was thinking. It was pretty, even beautiful, and when I first beheld it, wore the same melancholy expression. But this almost instantly lighted into a strange fixed smile of recognition. There was a silence of fully a minute, and then at length she spoke. I could not. How wonderful, she exclaimed. Twelve years ago I saw your face in a dream, and it has haunted me ever since. Wonderful indeed, I repeated, overcoming with an effort the horror that had for a time suspended my utterances. Twelve years ago, in vision or reality, I certainly saw you. 
I could not forget your face. It has remained before my eyes ever since. Her smile had softened. Whatever I had fancied strange in it was gone, and it and her dimpling cheeks were now delightfully pretty and intelligent. I felt reassured, and continued more in the vein which hospitality indicated to bid her welcome, and to tell her how much pleasure her accidental arrival had given us all, and especially what a happiness it was to me. I took her hand as I spoke. I was a little shy, as lonely people are, but the situation made me eloquent and even bold. She pressed my hand, she laid hers upon it, and her eyes glowed, as looking hastily into mine she smiled again and blushed. She answered my welcome very prettily. I sat down beside her, still wondering, and she said, I must tell you my vision about you. It is so very strange that you and I should have had, each of the other, so vivid a dream, that each should have seen, I you, and you me, looking as we do now, when of course we were both mere children. I was a child, about six years old, and I awoke from a confused and troubled dream, and found myself in a room unlike my nursery, wainscoted clumsily in some dark wood, and with cupboards and bedsteads and chairs and benches placed about it. The beds were, I thought, all empty, and the room itself without anyone but myself in it. And I, after looking about me for some time, and admiring especially an iron candlestick with two branches, which I should certainly know again, crept under one of the beds to reach the window. But as I got from under the bed, I heard someone crying. And looking up, while I was still upon my knees, I saw you, most assuredly you, as I see you now, a beautiful young lady, with golden hair and large blue eyes and lips.